Good evening and welcome to the 2021 Whitley Lecture given by the Reverend Dr David McLaughlin. The Whitley Trust exists to encourage Baptist scholarship and the lecture is a platform to showcases, showcase some of the rich resources of our denomination. My name is Sally Nelson and I've served as secretary to the Whitley Committee for the past 11 years, although I'm about to hand that role on. But each year it's a delight to see the quality and the range of the work presented by the elected lecturers. David's lecture, which you'll hear in just a moment, is entitled, Does This Cross Have Disabled Access? David and his wife Mary are joint pastors of Dormansland Baptist Church in Surrey. David got involved in researching disability and theology after many years of involvement in an organisation for young people with severe neurological conditions. He's written a book based on his work called Accessible Atonement, Disability, Theology and the Cross of Christ. This lecture will draw on some of the ideas that he explores more fully in that book, which you can also purchase. In response to David, we're also delighted that we're going to hear from Deborah Reed, who is tutor in Old Testament at Spurgeon's and has been so since 1987. She's also now director of undergraduate studies there. Deborah has been involved with disability issues at church, not least because she has an adult autistic son with learning disability and a speech and language disorder. We'd be delighted if you, the ones listening tonight, would also join in with your own questions and comments. Please type them into the chat and we will pick them up later on. And right now, we look forward to what David has to say to us, the Whitley Lecture 2021. Well, thank you very much, Sally, for that kind introduction and good evening to, uh, to all you who are um, who have tuned in. As Sally said, I am a Baptist minister and I'm speaking from here in Dormansland Baptist Church this evening. And in recent years, I've, I have spent quite some time looking at, uh, as Sally was saying, how as Christians, we think about and respond to people with disabilities. Now, I, I ought to say right up front that at this time, I don't have a disability. And so I'm not claiming to speak for people who are disabled. But having listened, and I hope paid proper attention, what I really want to encourage is that the whole church should be involved in a discussion about what we think about disability and our response to it. Is our response adequate? Is it convincing? Is it right? And so that's the spirit in which I, I'm offering this lecture to, to everybody. So what I'd like to explore this evening is one of those elephant in the room questions. One of those things about our Christian faith that, that's certainly big, uh, it often feels like it gets in the way. We're not quite sure what to do with it. And so we end up stepping around it rather than really dealing with it. And the elephant in the room is this. It's that lots of churches certainly are doing good work with people in their communities with disabilities. And lots of churches have very good inclusion policies. But still, we have a bit of a, a history, maybe an inheritance of linking disability and sin, of somehow feeling that the existence of disability in the world is all a result of the fall that we read about back in Genesis chapter 3. Even as we say that, though, 
I'm not sure we're quite convinced that that's true. Uh, we would like a better picture, but we're not sure where to go to get that. Now, it is true that some disabilities are caused by sinful action, or maybe violence, or by neglect. But lots of disability isn't caused by those things. And most of us will encounter disability as we go through life, one way or another. And chatting to friends and colleagues who live with disability, it's clear that there are negative aspects to it. There can be pain and loss and frustration and a society around us that often won't adjust itself so that people with disabilities can flourish. But it's also clear that there are lots of positive things, as there are with any life, things that could not have been experienced or learned through a different life. And so, so how are we to disentangle all of this and better understand how disability and sin and then healing and salvation are related to one another? How can we get on to firmer ground so that our sisters and brothers who are disabled are not just left in a, a sort of limbo wondering where the rest of the church thinks they fit into the gospel? Now, one of the reasons that we have this conundrum is that really the Bible itself doesn't always give us an easy answer or a clear answer on disability. We might think of the healing accounts in the Gospels, which are quite mixed. Uh, Jesus heals lots of people and he sometimes uses the expression, your faith has healed you or your faith has made you well. And the word for healed there also carries the meaning of saved. And so does that mean that to be saved and to be healed is somehow the same thing? Um, we, we can be worried that our thinking on this is all going to come a bit unstuck if we probe too deeply into what Jesus is doing and saying there. Uh, the, the healing accounts give mixed pictures, but certainly some of them give that picture. Well, let's not shy away from that. I thought maybe what we should do is use one of those healing accounts to explore this. Um, so I'm going to go to Luke chapter 5 from the Bible here, and I've chosen an episode that is in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's about a man who is paralyzed and who is brought by some of his friends to Jesus to be healed. Now, Jesus is in a house, but they can't get to him because there are so many people there. And so they let the man down through the roof tiles on his bed right in front of Jesus. And I'm going to pick up what Luke records at that point. So from Luke chapter 5, I'm at verse 20. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home, praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. <laughs> 
So I guess the, the, the problem that leaves us with is that Jesus does seem to be linking the healing from being paralyzed with forgiveness for sin in some way. That in some way, the same power of God is at work in both. Although even as we read it, we're not quite sure if that's the thing that Jesus is getting at. Of course, the healing accounts are very brief and we're unlikely to get a complete answer by just looking at this and the other accounts of Jesus healing. There isn't enough in them to give us the full picture. So what else might shed some light on all of this for us? Well, given the title of the lecture, uh, does the cro this cross have disabled access? You won't be surprised if I say that my suggestion is that we would be, be better off starting with the cross and with what the cross tells us about God's attitude to all of us, whether we are disabled or not. After all, the cross is the, the anchor point of our faith and our theology. The cross and the resurrection that it leads to is the central thing that ought really to shape the way that we all that we read all the rest of Scripture and what it tells us about God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The cross is the thing that reveals God to us more than anything else. But that's also part of the sticking point. Because if the cross is all about sin, the cross deals with sin, absolutely it does. But if the cross is all about sin and only expressed in terms of dealing with moral sins, then we would have to ask, well, how are all of the challenges and often experiences of suffering and hardship related to disability, how are they also addressed at the cross? Which after all, is where God addresses the whole human condition, unless somehow disability is also a matter of sin. But sin is a moral issue, it's a moral problem. So that seems to push us back to asking, is disability in some way a moral thing? Is there something wrong with it? Uh, so we're going to have to do a bit more work. If we're going to make progress on this and disentangle these thoughts, we're going to need a couple of things. We'll need a willingness to contemplate that disability is not just a result of sin, of the fall. Uh, it's not just a result of this turning away from God by Adam and Eve. And we'll need a willingness to contemplate that while the cross deals with sin, which it absolutely does, that saying that is not saying enough about the cross. There is something wider going on. So we would need to test both of these ideas, of course. Do they hold up? Do they make sense? Do they chime with what we believe about God and Jesus and the cross? We would need to look into the place that disability has in creation and then look at the place of disability in the redemption that comes through the cross of Jesus. So let's take the first of those then, creation. We would go right back then to what we believe about creation, that God created out of nothing. But also that creation is not just more of God, only God is God. Creation is not just more of God, otherwise it would be perfect as God is perfect. And we know for a certainty that that's not the case. When we try to scratch the surface of creation out of nothing and ask, well, how might that actually come about? How might it work? We're always going to be stretching our ideas a bit. But what theologians, people like uh, to name a couple, Jürgen Moltmann, Eberhard Jungel, 
Uh, others who have looked into this, what they've suggested is that perhaps in a sense at creation, God limits himself in some way. He limits himself to allow for a space, a, a nothingness to be there into which or out of which he creates creation. So God limits himself to allow creation to exist, creation that's other than God, that's not just more of himself. Now, that idea of God limiting himself it isn't just made up out of thin air. It's, it's consistent with how we see God act. He is willing to limit himself, in a sense, to place his glory, his presence in the tabernacle, in the Ark of the Covenant, with his people in exile, in the temp temple. And for us as Christians, most vividly in the baby in the manger. So God allows this nothingness out of which he creates. And then there is always this ongoing tension with that nothingness, it's, which we experience is a kind of pull back towards it that we experience as the pull towards perishing and chaos and death. And that, of course, has a moral aspect to it. There is sin and the choices that we make that lead to sin, that turning away from God. Uh, they are part of that, that pool, that tension. And we're culpable and accountable for sin and for those choices, definitely. But there's something wider, what we might call a, a contingency about creation. What I mean by contingency is all the things like the possibility of accident or unexpected variety of things that turn out one way but might have been another way. And, and that includes thing, things like, particularly talking this evening, many situations of disability. We know from the experience of real life that 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 mixture of sin and contingency and riskiness is a complex mixture. In fact, we're probably kidding ourselves if we think we can neatly separate things out and put them in sin and not sin boxes. And that complex mix is part of that tension, that pull back towards the nothingness out of which God created. And that's also what makes it so important that we don't just think of creation as a one-off event, one act. Creation's done, God's off doing something else. But rather, just as important is that from that moment of creation, God is intimately involved in accompanying and sustaining every breath, every ongoing moment of the life of his creation. He participates intimately in all of it. And the reason that all that matters is that if we take seriously creation out of nothing and creation not being perfect like God is and creation being full of potential, but having this contingency, this riskiness about it, well, that opens up the space where we can talk about sin and its effects. And we can talk about disability, having a place in the life of creation without feeling pushed into saying that one is always caused by the other. And that's important because it means that disability has its own legitimate place at the table, if you like, in creation. Now, the second thing that we wanted to think about was the cross, the place that disability has in God's redemption that comes through the cross and the resurrection. Part of that intimate participation by God in the life of creation that I was speaking about is that what we find is God, that God is willing for the consequences of how creation is to befall him. He's willing 
to take the consequences. Now, in the Old Testament, we see this mostly through his relation with Israel, God's beloved. And so that is in the continual turning away and the rejection and the spoiling of the gifts that God has given to his people. In the New Testament, we see it most vividly in Jesus. It all comes to a head in his passion and the cross. And there God is willing for the consequences of how creation is, including all of the moral risk of sin to befall him. At the cross, the consequences of, of the sin of those around Jesus befall him. And so at the cross, we can say that God is present in Jesus as the one offering the ultimate sacrifice once for all for the sins of the world. Just to borrow some words from Hebrews there. But that's not all. We can also say that God is present at the cross as the one who's responsible for the way that creation is. He is the one responsible ultimately for the fact that creation does involve lots of experiences of pain and suffering and unexpected joys and accident and contingency. That's that's some, sometimes bound up with sin and sometimes not in ways that are very hard to unpick. But God is there as the one participating in all of that life of creation, most in, intimately and intensely at the cross, willing to take the consequences of the way that creation is. And so... At the cross, we could say that everything that everything that alienates us from God, everything that cuts us off from God and indeed from each other is dealt with. Now, that definitely includes sin, the moral aspect that we are culpable for. But it surely also includes dealing with the negative aspects of all of that contingency, accident, variety, including the negative aspects of disability. Those things can also cut us off from a closeness to God. And those are dealt with at the cross. And all that is positive and wonderful and joyful and worth celebrating in the human condition is preserved and fulfilled through the resurrection. And so what we find then is that by going back and taking seriously God's creation out of nothing, taking seriously the fact that creation is not just more of God, it's not perfect in the way he is, taking seriously God's intimate, ongoing participation and sustaining of the life of creation, what we call providence, and then taking the cross seriously as definitely dealing with sin, but more than that, dealing with everything that cuts us off, everything that alienates us from God and from each other, taking all of those seriously, and at the same time, listening to the experiences of friends living with disability, not as exceptions, but as part of humanity as it is, we find that, well, we ought to be disentangling disability and sin. We ought not to be pushing them together in that simplistic way. And we ought to be saying that, yes, the cross deals with sin, but also that it deals with all that is alienating, all the things that, and the, all the things that, that cut us off from God, and the things that are not, the things that are good, are brought to fulfillment through the resurrection. And just as we sort of think about that, there's a there's a bit of a warning within that, a bit of a caution, that those of us who don't currently have what would be called a disability, we ought not to presume that we know what God ought to do in the lives of those who have disabilities. Life is more complicated than that, and we ought not to presume that we know what someone living with a particular disability 
ought to look to God to change or transform in their life and somehow impose that on them. Just a note of caution that, that comes out of thinking about that. So does all of this help us with that elephant in the room or with how we read the account of the paralyzed man and his friends? Well, I think it does. What we found in that account was that Jesus does place healing from being paralyzed and forgiveness for sins right there together in front of the people. And he does indicate very clearly that the same power of God is at work in both of them. And it seems that it's a, it's a foretaste of the power of the Holy Spirit that's, that will be at work through the cross and the resurrection. But at the same time, we also see that, that Jesus deals with each of them separately. So the same power of God may be at work, but the man's sins are forgiven and his paralysis is healed, but they are also held apart. And what we've been saying about disentangling sin and disability in creation and at the cross frees us up to read this more confidently. And so we can say, yes, the man's sins are forgiven. And we can say, yes, he is healed of his paralysis. And we can add that, yes, any social exclusion that he suffered because of his paralysis is dealt with because he's been restored in public. And we can say confidently that, yes, the same power of the Holy Spirit is at work in all of this. And we can say these are signs of the kingdom of God, but we can say all of it without worrying that in doing so, we are pushing sin and disability together. We can say that all that was alienating for this man through sin or through his experience of being paralyzed is dealt with. And all that was not alienating, all that was good and joyful in his life will be preserved and fulfilled through the resurrection. And that's because our confidence doesn't lie in finding all the answers in just what Jesus is doing in that particular moment, but it lies instead in our deepened understanding, our widened understanding of how at the cross, God deals with all of the consequences of the way that creation is. Now, I said at the start that we had this elephant in the room, which was an awkwardness around how disability and sin and healing and salvation are all connected. And that reading some of the healing accounts can add to that. Uh, but now what we can say is that our confidence doesn't come from trying to find all our answers just in texts, texts that mention disability um, throughout the Bible, but it comes from reading all of those instead in the light of thinking more deeply about the place of disability in creation and about the cross, that central point of our faith, in the light of, of having thought about disability. That there, at the cross, sin and everything in our experience of life that seems to cut us off from God and each other is dealt with, and everything that's good is preserved and fulfilled through the resurrection. And we can see that, that looking at it that way, we can see that Jesus uses situations that he comes across in creative and sometimes quite arresting ways to demonstrate and tell things about the kingdom of God and to address some of the failings in the thinking of the religious leaders around him. And we can do that confidently because our starting point is how God addresses the whole of humanity at the cross. So where we've got to is that if we're willing to contemplate the, the, the place in creation of not just sin, but of a wider 
contingency and riskiness in creation and willing to contemplate God's intimate participation in the life of creation and his willingness for the consequences of how creation is to befall him. And that that leads to the cross dealing with everything that alienates us and preserving what is good through the resurrection. Then we find that, that we do stand on much firmer ground. We stand then on ground where we can affirm that our sisters and brothers who are disabled and the rest of us are all fully embraced by the gospel right from the start. So thank you very much for listening to this lecture. And as I said at the start, my aim really is to encourage the church as a whole to be having this kind of conversation. And I hope that we might be able to begin some of that in the, the Q&A that will be coming up. But, uh, but back to Sally for now. Thank you so much, David, um, for that summary, which you delivered in such an accessible way. Thank you. Uh, we have got questions coming in, but before we move to those, I wonder if we could invite Deborah to bring her response uh, as parent of uh, a son with disabilities. Deborah, over to you. Thank you very much, David. I add my thanks to Sally's. Um, every time I hear you speak about disability and its interface with theology, I'm inspired. Um, but I also find that my theology is challenged. My practice is challenged. And I also find myself challenged at a personal, um, emotional level. And I want to thank you for your paper because your thought-provoking work, which it represents in this area, uh, really does bring hope and light to my own Christian journey. I also want to add that the same is true when I interact with resources provided by the BU Disability Justice Group. Um, so thank you to Sally and Craig Millwood and others who have contributed to those resources, um, some of which have been written by people with disabilities. And I really recommend people accessing those on the BU website. So my response to your paper, David, first of all, um, theologically, I think your paper presents us with several challenges, not least in terms of the language we use to talk about what the cross of Christ means and achieves. Certainly my own Christian experience, our songs and our worship and our prayers can give the impression that the relevance of the cross to humanity rests in the sole fact that it is there that we are saved from our sins. Your paper, David, has emphasised that this salvific work is, of course, true and crucial and important, but has suggested, too, that there is more to the work of the cross than this because the cross addresses a whole human condition, including that contingency that you spoke of, the contingency within God's act of creation. By focusing our minds on this, I believe the cross of Christ has something very specific to offer those who are disabled, be that in physical or intellectual ways. Pastorally, the language you have chosen of God participating in and with his creation at the cross seems particularly helpful to me. It allows us to work with a theological perspective that separates the origins of disability from the fall, thus breaking the link between sin and disability, which is a primary focus of your paper and which I personally consider absolutely crucial. I wonder if further reflection is required on the implications of this in relation to another theological discipline, namely eschatology. Speaking personally, I perhaps have been told too often by well-meaning Christians, no doubt, when my son's challenges have entered the public domain of church, meaning that my own physical and spiritual exhaustion at times has been all too evident, 
don't worry, there will be no autism in heaven. Such an eschatological claim suggests that disability is primarily being viewed as a problem to be resolved. And I've been left wondering if there is no place therefore in heaven for someone who I love, whose whole personality and being is defined by his autism. I also indicated at the start that my practice is challenged by your paper, and this incorporates many things, including the way I personally respond to people with disabilities, the way I act as a member of a church community, and how I need to rethink my practice when it comes perhaps to praying for people who request prayer for healing. But I want to think here about my reading and interpretation of the Bible. Your paper looked at the healing narratives in the Gospels, but you know that I have a special interest in the Old Testament and especially the book of Isaiah. Given the subject of your paper, David, my mind turned to the well-known Suffering Servant song in Isaiah 52 to 53. And it struck me that there are numerous terms there which reflect the experience of disabled people. And yet, I have never heard a sermon entitled The Disabled Suffering Servant. I mention this example for three reasons. First, I wonder if we are too quick to read biblical texts from an ableist perspective. In other words, have we created our own able-bodied suffering servant, perhaps because we have been too quick to read this song through the lens of the passion of Christ? Second, and closely related to this, I wonder how much, David, your own work on the cross of Christ has led you to re-examine texts like this. And thirdly, what has really struck me is how in this servant song, there is a movement for the suffering servant from a low point of rejection and towards exaltation. The servant remains in a place of ad adversity, infirmity, but that movement from rejection to exaltation comes through a change of response to him. So my question is this, does this text and others like it act as a model to abled outsiders in terms of how we might respond to disability? And therefore, does it point to ways in which we can lift up and honour the disabled in our churches and communities. My own suspicion is that there is something here about our understanding and recognition, mainly uh, perhaps uh, rather our misunderstanding and our lack of recognition of what calling and vocation is all about. And thirdly, I indicated when I began this response that your paper challenges me personally and emotionally. I just want to say a little about that. There have been many painful moments in 28 years of life with my disabled son. The painful moments I speak of are normally associated with my emotional responses to spoken words, looks or actions from within the church community about or towards my son. I find it very difficult to forget these moments. They affected me profoundly. Sometimes the words were glib, off the cuff ones, like those from another mum who said to me, why can't your son sit still in church? But sometimes they were preached words. For example, about the fact that we as human beings reflect God's Trinitarian character 
in our unsatiable desire to communicate with each other. But this was preached when my son was not speaking a word, not even giving any eye contact. Moments like those made me feel like my son with autism did not belong. I am challenged to forgive, but also to learn from these my emotional responses. What can I do to engender a sense of belonging, a real sense of belonging, not just inclusion? What can I do to avoid exasperating the pain for those living with disability? The biggest challenge for me practically and personally is about how we can engender real belonging in our churches. Your paper suggests to me, David, that this becomes a real possibility when we articulate a theology at every opportunity, which leaves us not embarrassed or inconvenienced by disability, but instead makes us grateful for the diversity within creation and grateful for the all encompassing efficacy of the cross of Christ. But then in addition, sees the potential of the Christian community to reverse the culturally normative preferences. Exemplified by the value we play, place on fast paced lifestyles, the high regard we have for intellectual capacity, the high regard we have for physical perfection. Surely instead we can articulate a theology and, a pract and practice a theology that embraces a new perspective, that values different things, like the gentleness, the vulnerability, the purposeful pain, and the endurance that the suffering servant of God himself demonstrates to us. Thank you so much, David, for giving me the chance to respond to your paper in this way. I'm sure others will want to respond too. And please continue to add your comments to the chat facility to engage with us. We realise we have so much to learn. We're so much, this is a conversation we learn from each other. But David, I realise I've asked a number of questions in this response that I've given. And I wonder if you want to start off our discussion by responding to some of my thoughts. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. That, that's a, a very, um, very thoughtful response. Um, and actually, there's lots in what you've said already, which I think we'll, we're already learning from. Um, maybe I'll just just take a, just a couple of minutes to, 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 to comment on um, a couple of the questions you raised. I, I think the will there be autism in heaven one is really important. And it, it's the sort of question I think we come across a lot and we have to tread carefully um, because it, it, it's difficult to know what experience someone else has of God and we don't want to presume that but I, I think what I've been covering in the lecture the, the, hopefully the contribution of that here is that it suggests that rather than saying that this part of what makes someone who they are it just gets wiped out is to say, well, the things, uh, the things about any of us that, that cut us off from God and from each other, the things that alienate us, well, those, those things are dealt with at the cross. Jesus takes them to himself um, without being diminished by them. But what is precious and good and joyful and to be celebrated is, is preserved and fulfilled through the resurrection. And that that distinguishing of, of those hopes, I think, is part of, of that picture. Um, I, I really like the point you made about Isaiah and the suffering servant. And it certainly 
true that it because when we read it as Christians, it, it seems to be so strongly pointing to Jesus. Other insights get kind of squeezed out of the picture. Um, so we read Isaiah 53 and, and we assume this disfigurement has come about by something like Jesus passion. But but actually, if we read it as it is, it, it just describes someone who other people find distressing and hard to be with and who, as far as they can tell, seems to be afflicted by God in the way they understand it. And then, as you say, surprisingly, that person becomes the instrument of God's dealing with the iniquities of others and is exalted to a position among the great. And so, so I, I think you're right that reading texts like that deliberately from a disability frame of reference opens up a space to talk, I think carefully, but to talk about people with disabilities having a particular calling or vocation um, within the life of the church, but the life of, of uh, humanity as a whole, part of which is maybe revealing that actually all of us are more vulnerable and less independent than we would like to think that we are. And that that op perhaps opens us more um, to what God might do in us. Um, I, the last point about how do we move to real belonging? I think this is this is um, this is this thing about the whole church being involved in the conversation. I think there are probably two parts to it. One is that when we take disability seriously, we we begin to realize that it makes us go back and rethink quite a lot of our theology and our preaching, quite a lot of how we uh, read the Bible and uh, apply it to, to ourselves. And the second is that as a whole church, we need to get stuck into to the conversation because it it's just, it's, this is just not a niche subject. In the end, disability pretty much affects us all. And I feel very strongly it's for church leaders to get that conversation underway, which um, I think you mentioned earlier, the, the disability justice group uh, of the, the, the Baptist Union. What we've been up to there is is launching the beginning of some resources that, to help churches to have a good conversation. Um, and so in those resources on the website, there's there will be, say, a testimony or a question that's that's explored and then some discussion questions to go with it. So um, I think you're absolutely right. And it's, it does, it needs church leaders to, to, um, to, to really pick up that baton and get that conversation going. Um, but anyway, back to Sally now, um, perhaps there are other questions that you wanted to, um, to bring to our attention. Yes, thank you, David and Deborah. And uh, we do have um, a stream of questions from from our viewers, so we'll we'll go through those. I wonder if I might just take the opportunity to respond to one of them, which was a question about whether there were any disabled people actually presenting. And I think David has actually presented this lecture jointly with a colleague who is physically yeah. disabled at times. This particular group uh, is a group of people who doesn't perceive themselves to have disabilities in the, the normally accepted sense, but both Deborah and I have um, adult children with uh, learning difficulties who cannot be agents for themselves. So we are both used to advocating on behalf of, uh, and I don't know about Deborah, but I find it quite difficult to work out sometimes where my daughter's disability ends and where my own life begins because we live so closely <laughs> together. But I know that's probably be not a full response to your your point but we, we, we have had representation in other places and certainly the disability justice group does have a variety of people upon it um so anyway without further ado let's address some of the questions that have come up and uh, david first of all there, there was quite a string of questions um about the the phrasing that we use do we say 
a person with disabilities or a disabled person and uh, there was quite a string of comments in the chat about people watching who do have disabilities saying I'm actually fine with being called a disabled person um, what, what would your feeling and response be on that particular one? Um, I, I think it's a great question because it, it goes right to the whole relationship thing. Um, we, we've had a, you know, we've kind of kicked that question around in, in the, the disability justice group, which is a very mixed group. Um, and, and in that group, there's a mixture of, of feelings and uh, there are people who are disabled and prefer to be called disabled um, because they'd rather, they feel that that's a more complete description of them rather than they're someone who is carrying around something called a disability um, and there are some who say well I prefer people with disabilities because first of all I'm a person and I'm not defined by the disability that's a second thing in in that person saying that's a second thing in their life so I I'm not sure as long as we're not using any of these things in a derogatory way, I, I, I'm not sure that um, that there's a single answer, other than um, if if we you know if we're getting to know someone, uh, to ask them what they prefer. Um, you know, the, we can't make up what somebody prefers. Um, far better to have a conversation about it. Um, so. Uh, in, in presenting something like this through the lecture, I, I used both both terms. Um, they are they are certainly the most common um, disabled people and people with disabilities, and I have no right to choose one over the other. So I so I used I used both, but always better to ask. It just has Thank to be. You. Thank you, David. And um, I, I hope that does go part way to responding to some of those comments. I know one person said my disability isn't an add on and they felt yeah. that saying they were a disabled person was a, a more inclusive way of looking at their yeah. being. But I, as you say, I'm sure it's it's a variation between people. So thank you. Um, there's another question now which relates to your your uh, exegesis of the Luke passage, David, and uh, it says that a resistant reading might say that uh, the man was healed when his sins were forgiven but cured when he got up and walked um, but the drive for the cure was um, a proof of authority on Jesus's part following the accusations of blasphemy that had been leveled at him rather than uh, the drive towards uh, sin and healing being uh, connected. Uh, would you like to comment on, on, on that, on those two things? Yes, yeah, definitely. No, I think that's, that's a really good comment. And, um, and it's, it, it's, 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 it's in very much in line with, with those, what, what you might call resistant or, or more thoughtful uh, readings of, of that text. And another kind of slight variation on a similar um, thing is to say, well, his forgiveness was for him, his healing was for the others, you know, because they, that, that's, I think what's, what you read out, Sally, is, is actually better than that. Um, so, and, and of course that comes to this whole question of, well, what really is the healing? Um, is healing just curing and fixing stuff? Or is healing a much more holistic thing? Um, and that then goes to the church. You know, is the is is the church just about fixing things, or is it about being mm -hmm. this body, this fellowship within which people experience a very deep holistic healing that is more about us as people than just about um, you know, whether we've we, we've got a particular ailment. Um, so I think that I think that's a, a perfectly good way of approaching this particular text. Um, where it becomes uh, interesting, and, and you, um, I, I think, is when we then say, "Well, what about the other healing texts?" This one's quite good because it's quite full. It's got forgiveness. It's got he healing. We can do a lot with it. Um, but we might find another text. Uh, let's take a couple from John. One where the man is born blind. Jesus seems to say there's no connection between his healing and uh, between his blindness and sin. 
And then just a couple of chapters before, he says to the person healed by the pool, well, don't sin again or something worse may happen to you. And so, so our reading of the, of the particular healing narratives, each one presents its own challenges and its own opportunities. And, and that's part of why I think we need to step back and say, okay, does our confidence just lie in being able to find a good, a good reading of a particular healing narrative? Or does it lie in something deeper like the cross so we can bring that to any healing narrative and say, oh, I wonder what Jesus is doing here, knowing that um, Jesus is positive about people with disabilities just as he's positive about all of us. I think it's going back and trying to equip ourselves to deal with any healing narrative, however long or short, and whatever Jesus is doing to be able to tease out the way that Jesus is is using a particular situation. So I, I like the reading that, that you um, brought out of the question there. Um, and it works well with this, with this particular text. But I think when we look at the range of texts and other things in, in the Bible, Old Testament as well as New, um, I think we need to draw on a deeper well, which I think is what we find at the cross. And I, I wonder if um, pertinent to this, there's a couple of things that were in Deborah's response, one of which was her reference to um, an eschatological uh, perspective on healing. Not, not only that perhaps sometimes our desire for, for perfection can be read back negatively into our yeah. experience now as Amos Young so uh, capably demonstrates, but also that there is something eschatological about all of uh, Jesus's signs. Um, and there is this inclusive community that we hope for, and our churches should hopefully be signs of that. And I'm, I'm minded that Deborah also mentioned the emotional pain that she feels when her son is ignored or slighted. And I would really echo that, Deborah, that, that I think, sometimes I think my daughter, I don't know if she feels the pain of her disability as much as I do, because she's non-verbal, she, she can't tell me, she's got very restricted communication. And sometimes I feel really hurt by something that's happened to her. And I'm not sure if she does, but a lot of that is, is the exclusion from the place where we should be most included. Uh, and it's, it's about that thing that's going on in church that it's set up for people who are able-bodied and not with a view to those who are not. Um, so I, um, I, I want to move on because there are a couple of other questions. I think we can keep going for, for a few minutes more. Um, if disability, one or two questions and comments around this theme, David, that uh, if disability is a consequence of this uh, creation, which just is in some ways, um, then can we say that disability is a sort of intention of God's creation? And one person quoted Exodus 4.11 to suggest that it might be. So I'll, I'll just read that because I did look it up at the time. So Exodus 4.11 says this. The Lord said to him, who gives speech to mortals? Mm. Who makes them mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Um, and so there, there are one or two questions around this theme of whether actually it isn't really God's fault at the end of the day. However you cut the cake, the culpability has to lie with him. Yes, yes. Um, in, and, and this, you know, we're, we're, we're holding these two things, aren't we? We've got the, you know, we've got the moral risk of God creating um, and we've got this other what, what I'm calling contingency you know the way life is so if I um, as has been the case in the past if I step the wrong way off a ladder um, things go rather bad um, and I don't think that was God's fault um, but it sounds a bit glib but uh, but in the end um, part of the mystery of things is 
there is only one God, there is only one creator, and he has created creation as creation is. And it, 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 was an, it, was, it seems that it was an extremely risky thing for him to do in the way that he did it. And he gave us all this freedom and, and um, such a creative environment in which to live. And yet, within that, there's the hazard of us turning away from him and saying, well, we're off to do our own thing. And so you end up with sin, which is so destructive. Um, and yet with, within creation as well, we've got, even we've got the weather. So we have a rainstorm, which for one person washes their home away and destroys their life. For someone else, brings the blessing of a crop um, where otherwise they would starve. And, and so, so there's this, it's a re the more you think about it, I mean, the more it's a very complex mix that is very difficult to unpick. Um, and so I know God says to Moses, you know, well, who did this? Um, but is he saying, you know, who, who made this, who chose that this particular person would um, be able to speak well and this particular person wouldn't, and this particular person would have a hearing impairment and this person wouldn't? Or is he saying, well, you know, who is the creator? just simply as he would does to job he's just saying well were you there you know this is the creation in which you're called to serve me faithfully um and in the end as i say god god takes all of the consequence on himself because we can't save ourselves um so going back to the question you know does that mean that that sort of disability is is meant to be um, the answer is I don't think I can answer the question because our experience of the world is only our experience of the world. We know the world contains sin and that that sin is ultimately dealt with at the cross. We know the world contains lots of other possibilities and potential and things that end up causing pain or causing joy and some of which are surprising. Um, but in the end, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, a new creation in which all that's good is preserved, but there will be no more tears, no more mourning and all, and all that sort of thing. And the picture in the middle of it is of Jesus who goes around healing people, forgiving people, restoring them to, uh, to society and to, to their, you know, their families and, and all of that sort of thing as a picture of the healing to come. Um, so, I, having looked into this and what is consistent with God creating, creation out of nothing, that's not more, just more of himself, it's not perfect, but it's good. Um, it seems to me that, that um, it's much more consistent to say that, that God doesn't absolutely make somebody, he says, this person is going to be um, short or tall, or bald, or born with one leg, but but creation includes that those possibilities, um, and we are called to live faithfully within them. And those possibilities, they are humanity as it is. They're not exceptions. They are humanity as humanity is. We've fallen into this view that humanity is 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 really just you know, within one standard deviation of the statistical norm. Um, it's not humanity, is humanity. And that's who God embraces at the cross. Bit of a rambling answer, but it's, but it's a great question. Um, and we don't really know the full answer. Thank you, David. I think that's a good theologian's response, if I may say so. <laughs> yeah. And we'll just take one last area of questions before we finish. Uh, so we're just over the hour now, but I think this one is really important, or these two connected questions are really important. And I wonder if, um, you know, I might ask if, if Deborah wants to offer any kind of a response to this, and then maybe, maybe David, a brief follow-up to it before we close. So there, there are a couple of groups of questions. One is about the whole thing of the praying for healing 
So should, I, I have disabilities, should I pray for those disabilities to be healed? And with what kind of expectation? And the other one is, um, you know, what what is heaven going to be like? Are we going to keep those disabilities that we have when we get to heaven? Uh, somebody questions about the good news. You know, what, what about the wounded and descended Christ? Um, you know, what, what do we think about the retention of of these things in the life to come. Um, I don't know if you, you you fancy having a crack at that, Deborah. <laughs> um, well, I could say something perhaps about the, the second of those questions first. Um, <laughs> one thing I recently read, I, I try to engage with people who are disabled and uh, one um, person um, put it like this and said, um, my disabled body um, has taught me who I am and who God is. Why would I therefore want to lose that in heaven? <laughs> and that struck me um, as being quite important perspective. Um, in some ways, my response would go back to what we were talking about in answer to the last question. Um, you know, how, how has God designed this world? Why is creation as it is? Um, what I'm pretty sure he didn't design is our cultural preferences, um, which are dominated by cognitive mm. um, dimensions, you know, valuing rational thought and intelligence above love and connection and, and slowness and dependence. Um, and so I, I think these good things mm. um, are things I don't want to see disappear in eternity. Um, they're things that I cherish. I've learned um, through walking with somebody um, who finds life, life challenging. Um, but I recognise that, you know, for other people, and that's where hearing voices from a range of people is really important when we discuss these things, because for other people, um, you know, heaven's not heaven if they are still struggling with perhaps, um, you know, a form of, um, disability or illness which they've experienced um, during this lifetime and I think that also applies to that first question about praying for healing um, I wouldn't deter anyone for praying for um, healing but surely um, you know as David said in his it's, we must listen to what people want to be prayed for <laughs> rather than assume um, what needs to be prayed for um, and I think healing, prayers for healing have to be very, very carefully um, determined and thought about. Um, I think, uh, you know, a lot of discussion needs to go along with the, an individual who asks for prayers for healing to help them to um, help the person praying really understand um, what the prayer, is, prayer request is all about. Mm -hmm. So I do, I do think in both those areas, I think the listening to voices and the range of voices that contribute to a debate on disability theology um, is so essential. I'm sure David's got more theological responses than those perhaps heartfelt <laughs> responses. Thank you. Um, uh, well, not not. I'll just say a couple of things, maybe. Um, I think your point, Deborah, about yes, always love to pray for healing if people would like that, but healing is a is a very broad thing and. Uh, we don't want to dictate what that is um, because it may be quite unexpected um, and what uh, we, we need to listen to what people actually want um, prayer for. Um, I, I think on the, um, the disability, you know, what will heaven be like thing, again, that you're absolutely right that what for one person, um, so if I think of perhaps two friends of mine, both of whom are uh, use wheelchairs, and I know that one, for instance, finds it something that they, they're just they're, you're looking forward to, to, to getting rid of in, in heaven and the other completely the opposite. And, and so it's not this temptation to, to, to put on to people what they find alienating and that, uh, that they want God to, to deal with and what they find actually part of who they are and that they that they that they would like to be see preserved and fulfilled and made more of um it's it's very tempting to uh, make lots of assumptions um 
I think um, the, just to pick up on just that one other part of the question about the wounded Christ, um, I think one of the great things that's come out in, in some of the writing about disability theology is, is the idea, well, what about the wounds that Jesus has, the risen Jesus? He has the wounds of the crucifixion in his risen body. And assuming he carries those through his ascension, that shows a couple of things. One, it shows such a solidarity with humanity, with all its impairments, mm -hmm. um, but also this tantalizing sense that some of the things that we might think of as impairments perhaps have a very significant place in the new creation um, and will become a blessing to everyone. So, so these are, you know, we, these are glimpses. We don't have the whole picture of what that will be like, but, but, um, but encouraging glimpses though, I think. Thank you. And uh, as we draw to a close, I, I think I'm left with two very brief uh, overall reflections. And one is really the, the number of assumptions that we bring to our, um, our doing of our Christian faith, really. <clears throat> and one, it, one is that so much we read and interpret scripture from an ableist perspective. And, um, you know, how many stories where we see the disability as a negative, but actually that's just the way we're reading it. And, and, and it, the, the intention may be very different. So uh, there's a scholar called Jeremy Shipper, who's written extensively on the fact that the suffering servant may well be a figure with disabilities, but we'd like to think of it as an able-bodied person who has been afflicted and we read it that way. And so the disability just disappears. And, and similarly with John Hull and John's gospel, John Hull being a blind priest who's recently died, uh, talks about the, the light and dark, the blind and the seeing metaphors in John's gospel as just being profoundly unhelpful to someone who is blind in this life. And, and I think my other, my other reflection connected with this is our assumptions about heaven, that, that actually it may be a very different form of reality from that which we stand on at the moment. And maybe the disability question will be a non-question for all sorts of reasons mm. that we, it just blasts our imagining, doesn't it? So thank you so much for all that you've shared with us, David. Thank you, Deborah, for your beautiful and personal response to David's words. And thank you so much to the, the people who have sent in those questions, which are excellent. And I think really put the finger on some of the key questions for us. Uh, as the whole people of God, we, we so need to hear and learn from one another wherever we're standing. So thank you for your participation. And uh, just a quick thank you too for the, the group um, who have facilitated the technical side of this production. Um, you, you're not seeing them, but they do such a lot behind the scenes. So thank you to you. And now let me pray for us all before we go. Our loving Lord and Father, you created this earth, this universe, in all its variety and complexity. And we give you thanks because you looked at what you had made and said that it was very good. And so, Lord, forgive us when we do not see that goodness or when we fail to look for the goodness that we do not first perceive. Forgive us when we exclude and help us to be encouraged when we include. And Father, give us grace with one another as we pursue this journey together. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross, the resurrection, and the promise of a different way of being. And help us to try and make that a reality in our own lives, in our own churches, in our own communities. And so fill us with your spirit, bless us with your wisdom and grace and send us out rejoicing in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us.